We are back in the building obstacles to opportunity with another everyone hates Tesla. Now, let's see it. I don't see people out here doing a deep dive. I definitely hear people out here talking trash about the cyber truck. But is anybody out here peeling back the layers? All right. Shout out to Sandy Monroe. Sandy Monroe. They're always out here showing the great videos. Monroe live is what we're going to be watching. But let's do a deep dive. Rock with your boy. Let's deep dive into this. Let's ask the real people on the ground, the engineers, right? Let's not the haters, the YouTubians, the YouTubians who used to like do plumbing or the YouTubians who used to, you know, twiddle doorknobs and now they're YouTubian and they're like, I know everything and I'm finna hate on Tesla or I'm gonna come out and show why the Cybertruck is a piece of garbage. Like, bro, you're, what, what, what is your claim to fame? Well, I'm on YouTube. Get a life. Like what you did in real life. Anyways, let me go back to the video, man. So Tesla Cybertruck rear body panel and castings. Let's actually do a deep dive and just listen about the car. Like the undisputable engineering from engineers on the ground. And then also let's just hear. Let's let's experience, right? Structure is based on the like primary vehicle design. You know, the, all, yeah. all the suspension loads go through here. Yeah. So we're trying to get our torsional stiffness from this. We're also supporting the bed loads. It's 2,500 pounds. Yeah and the towing loads, which is 11,000 pounds. And they all go through here. When you put all that math together, right, then you end up with sort of like an elegant load path structure of trying to get back to our nodes at the batteries and the corners and from back here. Then the, the crash really just becomes a fallout of how do I keep that stiffness where I need it for all those loads to, to, to be distributed? And then what can I absorb you know, when, when I get hit from behind? But cr crash is actually the simple part of these designs now. Well, that's good. The crash is being the simple part. Welcome back to Monroe Live. I'm here with uh, Jordan. And uh, today we're going to have a look at uh, some of the skins. Um, this is the rear fender or some could be called almost a quarter panel, but it's going to be the rear fender for today. Um, Jordan has had a whole lot more experience on this than I have. And the only thing I can tell you is that um, that is not powder coat. Um, this is this would be e-coat. And um, I love the uh, <clears throat> the, uh, um, the Easter eggs, Easter eggs yeah, you yeah. Pound, pointed out, even... Uh, even it's uh, cut out here, it's kind of cool. Um, and um, <clears throat> and uh, we are looking at steel, magnet steel. So um, the uh, the deal here is um, uh, Jordan is gonna be probably doing most of the talking. Um, uh, why don't we start with uh, why there's little bumps in here when you're fooling around with e-coat. Yeah, so if we, if we look at this whole thing to orient everyone, this is the rear body side of the Cybertruck. So behind us, you can look here. This is the big stainless panel that would bolt onto the side of this. Um, so this is the wheel arch cut out and so forth. So we're looking at the inboard side of it. So on the outboard, we've got the stainless inboard. We've got stamped steel, all e-coated stamped steel subassembly. Um, and, and it is e-coat, right? Because you can see the difference between an e-coat, nice shiny coverage versus something like they do on the rear, which is like kind of a, a matte finish powder coat. So this is just appearance for blackout, right? So that when you open the tailgate or something, you're not seeing this sort of green colored e-coat. But now, let me stop there. Why does this matter, guys? Because this is just great American ingenuity, engineering, and manufacturing. And we want to actually just comb through the details. So when you're actually thinking about Tesla, you're not thinking about it only from performance of financials or Elon's tweets, but you're able to understand what are the engineers doing on the ground, right? And the skill sets that engineers have and just the culture at Tesla, how do they push the envelope when it comes down to manufacturing, assembling, everything else that comes with it. And so this is just a good look into that to dive deep. It would be no different than looking in the process of how actual Foxcom makes the iPhone, but you don't get to see that, right? Because it's a third party. This is vertical integration. And so we get to actually see this and shout outs to Monroe and his team. They're breaking it down. Let's continue. But, but talking about the assembly here and, and what we saw when we removed it from the vehicle, clearly they're using this whole inner assembly to garner back quite a bit of structure. So it's all using some structural adhesive, some bonding um, to the parts below it. And you'll see, I, I wanna point out a few unique features as we go through this, um, but maybe we'll start with, with this. You might look at this and say, well, why would you put like a weird flute here? Why would you open up um, a gap right here? Why would you have another kind of opening at the bottom here? That's because this is a multi-piece sub-assembly that gets brought to the vehicle as likely one large piece. Yep. And since this is a sub-assembly, the whole thing is gonna go through an e-coat dip or a bath all at one time. And when you do that, you can't have any of that e-coat, that liquid, get trapped in any one of these cavities. You need an escape path. So when you see, I've, 
often when you see unique paths or, or weird, you know, orifices in an assembly like this, you got to look at eco first and foremost to figure out is that an escape path. If you look closely at most body and whites unibodies, you'll see any number of escape paths like that. For this one, this one's a little unique. Yeah. So you can see that this one, there's two telltales that to me say this is probably not just eco. In fact, it may not be eco at all drainage. Yeah. So one is the fact that it's slightly proud. It's taller relative to this flat surface. And two, and this is the dead giveaway, you've got two spot welds. So if you notice a moment ago, I had said this whole assembly is using structural adhesive to bond to the stainless. Well, here they've got spot welds, which means that they're not going to the stainless on the outboard side. What this is, is an additional layer of the, the stamp steel below it coming all the way to the flange here. So that's an additional section here. So well, just, it's, a, it's a stiffener, it's a, a stiffener. And there, there may be another reason. And um, it's hard to say because um, quite frankly, we don't know everything about this, but it could be for thermal expansion as well. Every once in a while, when you have dissimilar materials like the stainless to this mild steel, you're going to have situations where mm, it needs to breathe. And, um, and that could be something there. It's not, it should have been closer to the center for that, but it's probably close enough. But at the end of the day, something may be here that uh, it would cause a hum or um, some kind of rattle or whatever. There's a lot of reasons for putting a stiffener in here and not all the, all the way across, because it's obvious that whatever's in here is only in a small area. Thanks to the Three Dimensional Services Group for sponsoring this video. Whether you're looking to source metal stamping, precision CNC machining. Okay, shout out to them for doing that service. So as you can see, <laughs> they don't know technically why they might have done that specifically, but still they're going to be able to at least give you some commentary on what they do have as ideas of why they might have done that. And so stiffening might be one, so that makes sense. But other than that, I'm lost in the barbecue sauce. I think it's interesting. <laughs> but I'm like, dang, it gets that deep. So let's skip past this and go back to the video. Allow these guys to get back at it. The ghost started coming through on the cyber truck, the castings and all the structure underneath. This, this is the answer to many of the questions that I had leading up to it, which is how in the world are you going to efficiently or in any way for that matter, attach a giant brake vent stand, or stainless steel panel that's so thick where you can't really get the same types of flanges and unique geometry, not easily anyways, that you can with this stamping. This subassembly is doing the work of most of that interface to the castings. Right? Right. So not, not only is this providing a pretty significant measure of stiffness on this panel, like torsionally speaking, it's also providing all the interfaces, some of those more uh, geometries that we're seeing in the rear for the, the lift gate attachment, right? some of the latching interior panels and so forth. So this, this panel right here is doing quite a bit of work and it's really the enabler on the outside of the vehicle to get that nice smooth appeal um and, and really this is this is the guy doing a lot of work to make sure as much as possible that we're not getting a lot of weird rippling or warping um on this stainless panel so if you look down the side of the vehicle you know you don't want to see a potato <clears throat> chip right that's bad um there's a lot of work that's going into the differences in thicknesses where and how they're attaching it the spring back all the rest to make sure that this panel is nice and straight as well and this is right and, and that's very interesting especially when you have that large of a piece right now other companies might not have that large of a piece just one consistent steel so with that being said they're going to have to come up with creative ways to not have the rippling and everything else that comes with it and so this is, might be an innovative way for them to allow the panel to be stiff. Now, again, one of the main philosophies and approach is to delete more pieces. And so to have that just simplifies the process, but of course you're gonna have to come up with techniques so you don't lose that stiffness. And this is one of the techniques with this sub panel. So I'm gonna allow them to continue. This is what kind of you could call an exoskeleton. So um, I've been critical saying this isn't an exoskeleton vehicle. Obviously, you can see there's a skeleton, <clears throat> but in this case, the exoskeleton is needed in order to keep all these uh, all these chunks of stainless steel flat, and and you know and and keep them there forever. Um, even though this is very thick and whatnot, it it has no strength compared to what it, what you're looking at here. Yeah. So, by the way, the other thing is, um, um, I think you already mentioned. I think you already mentioned it. This. Um, <clears throat> the stainless steel is actually glued. These two parts are glued together. Yep. Um, and um, we found um, a little point where you can have a look at it <clears throat> over here. Uh, normally we do not like to bend things, but this has already been scanned, so we're good. But you can see we got a little lump of that. So we will be giving that to our adhesive chemists and they will be telling us what the heck, um, what, it, what all this thing is about. 
why don't we why don't you talk a little bit about the laser welding and then we yeah. can get into yeah so on this upper flange uh which would be the bed rail right if you're walking up to the side of the truck this whole zone right here if you look underneath you'll see some weird lines those are laser welds so um they're linear in some cases you know we're seeing a little bit of variation right not perfectly straight but it could be just because they're, they're running them fairly quickly and they don't care if they're, they're perfectly straight or not because as long as they're there they're doing the job the the odd thing about these laser welds is they're incredibly the way that they're laid out right now all in linear fashion like this it makes the joint you know strength in this this panel versus this one incredibly strong in the fore aft direction so mm -hmm. essentially along the axis of the weld you've got a lot of surface area that's really going to give you a good weld bond versus just a cylindrical spot weld the downside to that and largely the reason all right so that was the upside now he's going to say what the downside is to doing that okay let's see that you're seeing some of them be staggered a little bit is you do lose some Heel. sheer strength yeah some yeah. sheer Heel. strength in the in the other direction so yeah. mm. um it's it's hard to okay and so to compensate a little bit is they staggered the actual horizontal lines but interesting say there, there's a lot of advantages to laser welding um but this one may be laser welded uh, due to spot weld done, access, how the assembly came together. Um, I'd want to get this extra layer off and look at the underside and see how it's put together. But that could be one of the reasons that they'd go to a laser weld. There was a couple spot welds down here, but maybe Grace, there's if you a ton of them in. over there. There's a whole bunch of examples down here, right, where they're they're able to get some good solid spot welds from <clears> panel <throat> to panel. And you'll see from a standoff perspective, you don't want the panels to be touching 100%. Um, that can give you dimensional issues and all sorts of weird things. So where they want to touch down and weld, they give themselves a nice flat. Um, they stay away from the radii, right? Keep those spot welds in a nice flat surface, good index, and they'll spot weld anywhere that they really need to, even the small brackets down here, for example. And you'll notice too, like most people are not really terribly familiar with how spot welders work, but they're like a big pincher. And so you've got to have room to get in and spot weld if you're going to be doing something like I'm taking this piece and I'm welding it to that piece. You have to be able to access them. One of the nice things about lasers, nah, I don't need anything. I can shoot right through them. And uh, that to me is why I, I'm a, I, I prefer spot welds only if I can't find any other way of doing it. Um, they're the cheapest uh, to, to put out, but there's a lot of maintenance associated with it and other things. I really like, um, my guess is that this is a Trump laser. And I like their, uh, their lasers. Um, and to me, if I was going to be into uh, uh, creating a factory <clears throat> and I had to choose between four or five different kinds of spot welds, or actually three or four, and, uh, and the multitude of... Uh, options I've got with laser welding, I'd probably choose laser. Okay, so if Sandy had the rock, he would choose laser also. And I find this very interesting. Again, guys, you're just going to actually get to see the details of what it takes to build these cars. And we went from the Model 3 of it actually being a manufacturing hell, but not knowing what to do at least as good as what it is in the Cybertruck. So as you can see and look back into the Model 3 early when, you know, Tesla was ramping, you could see all the actual steps that they took. Now, of course, I reviewed the deep dive before where they deleted almost 300 parts out of the process. But this is actually being able to dive into what type of techniques they're utilizing. And this is very interesting if you are actually attempting to understand what do they have here? Is it just a battery that's, you know, the rave. Is it Elon and his tweets that's making it? So, no, no, no. It, it's down to the actual engineering that's happening on the ground. It's very interesting. And if you see it, then you'll understand why a CEO from Toyota would say that the Model Y is a masterpiece. It's because when they actually cracked that bad boy open, they saw the process that was different from the legacy auto manufacturing companies. Let's get back into this video. Hold on. I didn't get the first in because it was a uh, pause. Here we go. Uh, options I've got with laser welding, I'd probably choose laser. Now let's look at the castings a bit. So when we looked at the 2022 Model Y and we looked at the first giga casting, one major thing that changed was not just uh, the casting. See, so now he's going to look from what changed from the mega casting from the Model Y, but now to the Cyber. Let's go. Casting, it was the bill of process and the whole GDMT, so geometric dimensioning and tolerancing strategy how they actually allowed and, and restricted cross-car slip and movement from an alignment perspective. The Model Y was the first vehicle that we saw come in from Tesla, where at the bottom of the vehicle, it was locked in, meaning there was no adjustment left available cross-car. We're seeing a similar thing here. The telltale is there is no layered panel or cross-car slip available, no flat surfaces that would allow you to freely move in the Y-axis for you CAD spinners out there. 
at the major structural interface between the occupant home, this multi-piece stamp steel assembly, and the gigacasting. They actually use, which is not actually commonplace for Tesla on their castings, but they use a few SPRs, yeah. some structural adhesive, and a few other things to attach those. But what they're doing, in essence, is they're saying the castings are the first to go in the line, and that is going to lock in the entire vehicle's base, the underpinnings, dead nuts, and the y-axis. In other words, the castings are now the fixture. So normally people buy fixtures. These guys, what they do is they cast fixtures and they utilize them for the rest of the body build. And I think, and I've said this about a zillion times, I've been a big fan of casting. I had that one sitting on the floor for 15 years. I know that this is the right way to go because I don't want to buy a thousand fixtures that always go out of uh, uh, out of spec and tolerance. This yeah. and tolerance, and this is a big yeah. So you got a thousand fixtures going out of specs and out of tolerance, and then you got quality control and everything else that comes with it. Different vendors, different prices. You know, volatility on those fixtures creates a problem. Again, this is the amazing part. But when you do the deep dive, you can understand it. If you don't. You're just going to pass over these finer details and you're going to actually end up only dealing with details that almost have nothing to do with anything like allegations about sexual harassment. Like, come on. It's a big thing. Tolerance stack up is a killer. The older a body line is, the worse the tolerance stack ups are. And so that's where you get things that don't fit or worse yet, they fit in such an ugly way that you can see them from the moon. So this is a very, very smart way to make things happen. Let the castings be the fixture, and let me use that to build everything else from it. Perfect. And and, and you never lose the fixture. It's always here. No. They didn't, they didn't say, hey, we're going to lock it in at the bottom, and we'll never adjust anywhere else. They still smartly, right? And I think necessarily, they left themselves some opportunity to do some of that cross-car split, just like the 2022 Model Y. So as we go upward in vehicle, and we look at the, the extra castings that they've got that make up the whole upper structure of the vehicle, you see that this piece is not a casting, it's a stamped panel, and it's an interface between the major lower giga casting and this upper cast piece. And so what I believe that they're doing here, notice it's a flat surface, here in the back where these two other castings come together, right? So this flat surface here, and then also down below where this casting meets, mates up with the, the major lower casting, there's a common theme here. They got flat surfaces in all three of them. So more than likely, as we were talking about warping and that sort of potato chip thing on the body side outer subassembly, in order to make sure that that thing is not cattywampus relative to the vehicle, right? That everything is true, the tailgate fits properly, they can control those gaps. They're allowing themselves some cross car slip, some adjustment via some of these flat surfaces. It's not a lot, right? They're probably not moving this multiple millimeters, but a fraction of a millimeter is what we get into right. in terms of tolerancing. So, so before we move off of what you just said, Grace, can you come around here? And I want, to, I want you to pretend you're, uh, you're shooting a deer. Okay, I want you to look at this line right here, all the way through. You're gonna be looking at something that is about as straight as a die as you can possibly get. This is a very, very difficult thing to do in a normal pickup truck. To get the, to get the box so that it's square to the world. Very, very difficult thing to do in a normal pickup truck. So don't come here with other pickup trucks in mind. Let's just talk about the engineering, not the design. So keeping that in mind, this time, listen to this prime information that's coming from Sandy. World is near impossible. And when you see this line as straight as what I was just looking at a second ago while, while Jordan was talking is um, almost miraculous. So here's a spot weld that um, is, uh, it was invented, I think, by General Motors and it's a concentric spot. So you got aluminum to aluminum. <clears throat> These kind of spots, spot welds are unbelievably strong. General Motors did a good job in inventing that. Yeah, and, it, and actually, Sandy, to your point, it's a, it's a slight twist from what they did because General Motors, um, their version of it has a bunch of rings in it. If you, yeah, if you remember. that one's got rings too. This one doesn't have the same rings though. So if you looked at mm. a CT6 or any of General Motors spot welds, you'd see some very crisp circles. And what that was allowing General Motors to do is reduce the number or increase the number of spot welds yeah. that they could get before they had to redress the tips. Exactly. Right. I, I believe it was in the in, on the order of tripling the yeah. amount of spots yeah. that they got. So I don't I don't know if Tesla did a variation to that or what have you, but I will say this. Not only to spot weld two castings, so that's interesting. They also spot weld a stamping to a casting. And it's like, wow, okay, that's cool too. The wild part is is they're spot welding both of those right through structural adhesive. Yeah. And I thought that that was the main reason for the um for the um um 
extra circles, if you want to call them, it was because now I can uh, I can penetrate a whole lot better. Um, like giving giving yourself a nugget, and that's what that's called. Mm -hmm. And this is like, um, is this is this a T two or a T three? Is there a three in there? No. Well, it... hey, look, we're copying GM a little bit, but GM, okay, you got the rings. Now that's very interesting about how GM utilizes that. I don't know if that would help or hinder the process of what Tesla is currently doing, but it's very interesting. Can we apply that? Can we jack from them? They're going to jack from us. That mega casting, they're going to start jacking from that. They're going to start doing that for those people who don't know what that meant. No, it was only two. So this is a T2. Two thicknesses that's welding through, I think. Kind of right. Yeah. And, um, and that means that, for, and for that thickness, <clears throat> that's going to go for a, quite a while. Um, that's a lot of energy that has to go into those resistance spot welds. Yep. Yeah, and you can and you can see, you know, like we're th this dimensional topic. You might you might just look at castings and be like, wow, tons of ribs, lots of engineering. But this whole dimensional GDNT topic is a phenomenally difficult and specialized practice. Where if done wrong, you can take yeah. the best concept or design in the world, and you can release a vehicle off the line that's barely worth driving. Looks like a banana and drives like a dog, yep. and that's that's kind of one of the reasons why. So many people spend so much time on the assembly line trying to make sure <clears throat> that from a, a dimensional stability standpoint, you've got to have everything on your side, yeah. not one. Yeah, and let me highlight that before you continue, Sandy. Look, it, that assembly line process is not easy. So all the time we hear about competitors, and it's like to actually scale a vehicle, not a limited production vehicle, but to scale, it's a delicate balance. It's not as easy as most people map it out to be. So when you do see new cars come out and there are limited production, that's great. And I'm not actually hating on that. The more the merrier. But to scale, and once you start getting those cars on the assembly line, it's an entirely different beast. You got to produce them back to back. One thing or two things, but everything. And looking at this just makes me happy. Yeah, ordinary. Everything. You got to get everything on point. Early, if you were to draw an analog to a stamped assembly, right? I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven. Seven parts per side on this, this sub-assembly, major parts. If you were to look at a stamped equivalent, you're looking at 100 parts. Easily. Right? So you might say, man, that's a lot of parts. 100 parts. Seven from 100. Let's see. That's a lot of parts to align. This is like putting Legos together, relatively speaking, in mm -hmm. terms of the intricacy and the amount of gd &T and fixturing and so forth that you'd have to go through. So quite a bit simpler. It's like putting Legos together. And remember the book, if I read it to you guys on Elon Stories, that's the concept that Elon Musk wants to approach the market with. It's, hey, let's build this car and be able to put it together like Legos versus the hundred pieces that he was talking about, which would be very complex to actually implement. Simplified, although... You know, uh, perhaps if you've never seen a body structure or something, you might still think there's a lot going on here. This is quite simple. It is. It's about as simple as you can possibly get. And it's certainly <clears throat> it's certainly simpler than what we would normally expect to see out of anybody. I don't care who it is. Um, uh, this is uh, I, I, I do gush uh, a bit uh, about what's going on with Tesla. I just like the fact that, you know, we, we have a lot of rules when we tell people how to design their products. And it's nice to see people that have actually taken those rules and and put them into um, into effect. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's certainly, no one's without their issues. There's certainly, uh, they have struggles with certain things, just like any OEM, but you have to appreciate yeah. the fact that they're gonna, they're just gonna go for it. So anyway, this uh, this vehicle is gonna have the, uh, after it's done gauged, uh, the scanning and whatnot, after it's out of the gauge, then what's gonna happen is all these panels are gonna go back on and the uh, the body is gonna go for nodal testing. Uh, and that means that, not us, because we haven't got any equipment like that. Um, the <laughs> he, he said, we ain't got equipment like that, but hey, they struggle just like any other OEM company, but you still have to just sit back and relax and say, wow, uh, they've been able to implement some strategies or some methods that are groundbreaking. And as Sandy said, something that they have been screaming about for the longest to be corrected. The whole body will go into basically a giant fixture and go, eh, 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 and they'll do everything they can to see how stiff the body is. And that'll be measured in hertz. And when we find out uh, from our new best friends down the road, um, then we'll um, we'll let you know. So with that, Jordan, thanks everyone. Reach out at sales at leandesign.com if you have any questions. Hey, see you, Sandy Fair. Used to them, man. Hey, great video. I think it's very interesting. 
most people don't get to see that detailed breakdown, you know? They just kind of, you know, hear what they hear and don't quite understand it. And that's okay. That's okay. You know, the financial media is not going to be talking about that. They're going to talk about year to date and all this other nonsense. Let's see what the people are saying before we head out of here. He said, I like when Jordan is in the show, very knowledgeable, good with his explanation. Please have him on more. I agree. And the next person says, I would like to see a deep dive into the automotive adhesive, which are used so much now. And another great informative video. Thank you. And then let's go down. And I've been waiting for this analysis and you did not disappoint there is styling and there is engineering. Most people respond to the styling and don't see the engineering behind the vehicle. That is the real story. Thanks, Monroe. And exactly. And that not only goes to just people who are seeing it and could be customers, but that also goes down to investors. Investors just don't do a deep dive and see the engineering behind it. And not to be behind a company with great engineering, versatile, diversified, and innovative engineering puts you guys in the back end of actually being that investor who's going to be able to see a great company in the midst of good companies. You're going to be able to understand like, wow, man, this company does a great job at engineering. So it's not about mostly Elon all the time. It's about the engineering. If this engineering didn't back up Elon, then I would have a different perspective about the company for sure. But the engineering is there, right? Go to, let's see, channels. Channels are for drainage to prevent water and dirt buildup and ultimately prevent corrosion. And then they obviously have nothing to do with the e-coding drainage in this application. And since the panel has already been prior to the bond in the, of the stainless exterior, shout outs to him. Hilarious the way they talk about how simple the alignment of the components is in the Tesla compared to other cars. And while at the same time, ignore Tesla's leg legendary inconsistency panel gaps. So a panel gap, right? Because you hear that a lot about Tesla vehicles, right? Now, if you actually did a survey of the customers, okay, not anybody else who's just allegedly saying, hey, I got this video for, you know, I got this car for a YouTube video. But if you actually look at the reports and the surveys conducted, it's a small portion of people, less than 10%, who said they had some cosmetic issues, which would, you know, qualify as panel gaps. That's it. But for the most part, when we're talking about 80% plus, most of the people are saying it's not coming with those issues. So unless you have numbers about panel gaps and not over-exaggerated YouTube videos by YouTubians that probably rent the same damn car, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the panel gap is just a minor issue. But let's go back to the engineering. It, it, can that still be denied? panel gaps. Until somebody shows me a survey where the majority of Tesla vehicles has panel gap issues, I'm not really worried. I need the surveys. I need the reports. I don't need a couple of people saying, hey, man, panel gaps, panel gaps, because they say a bunch of things, right? Like, hey, Tesla is, is a big problem. They're actually really losing. And then it's like, bro, they're the best-selling car in the world. Like, but, but, but I heard, I heard, I heard, I heard, I heard, I heard. I don't care what you heard. I don't, I don't, I don't care what you think. What's the information on the ground? And the information in the ground is everyone loves to hate Tesla. And the information on the ground is also America's the best out here to do it. I'll see you guys on the next one. Enjoy the deep dive. If you're watching it, hit the like button and maybe don't share because, you know, my videos are kind of hostile and I want you to send this to normies and it hurts their feelings. So shout outs to USA. Once again, shout outs to Tesla.